Cisco stock is the topic of today's presentation. And if you're somebody that's invested in CSCO stock or thinking about investing in Cisco, then you'll want to watch this because we talk a lot about what the company has been and where they're going. So Cisco came up, uh, this was six years ago we wrote this piece, what is the best performing tech stock ever? And we tried to figure that out based on the annualized return of various tech firms over given time frames. So you can see here Cisco over 27 years returned close to 30% every year. So that's the equivalent of the share price going from about four cents a share to $38 a share, a 98,582% return uh, over this particular time frame. Now, you could do this exercise any number of ways, but the point here is that Cisco has been a high flyer over time, and there's certainly some brand recognition associated that with that. Now, when I think about Cisco, it's what I learned in B school, and we, I think, did a couple case studies on this firm. And we learned that their competitive advantage is the ability to integrate tech companies they acquire. That's their whole business. That's their platform. Now, there's some debate around that, whether that's a competitive advantage or are they squandering cash and stock when they buy firms that they then retire their technology later because it was a bad acquisition. You can't win them all. This is a table of acquisitions over the past 10 years, and you can see how big these numbers are. So, in 2012, nine acquisitions, 2013, 11. You know, 11 acquisitions, that's like one a month. And you imagine that they have to integrate these firms into the Cisco ecosystem. And it must not be easy, though. One can imagine they have a process down by now. But a number of, as I said, Cisco's acquisitions were criticized for either overpaying or acquiring technology that then disposed of years later. Now, when it comes to how they were making these acquisitions, this figure here is interesting. It shows whether they paid in shares, that's in yellow, or they paid in cash. Now, on the lower right here, you see a stock price chart, and that big spike there towards the left, that was the year 2000, the dot-com days when um, Cisco was at its uh, pinnacle of performance. And that would have been a good time to exchange your shares for other firms. And uh, most likely, uh, they would have also been involved in some of the mania around that time, um, purchasing firms that didn't yet have revenues, things like that. But you can see here the number of acquisitions they had in the year 2000 was, um, looks like, around 26. That's a ton. And then it tapered off after that. And they continue to make lots of acquisitions, except these days they're paying in cash. Now, this chart along with the previous table, came from this excellent paper that's a, a bit verbose, and it'll take you a long time to read through, but there's some good tidbits in there, and it's called Cisco's Transformation from Innovation to Financialization. And the claim here is that the U.S. has fallen behind global competitors when it comes to 5G and Internet of Things. The problem, they say, is the dereliction of key U.S.-based business corporations to take the lead and here's why they say that Cisco fell behind. The investments in organizational learning required to generate cutting-edge communication infrastructure products weren't there. And this would make for a great case study. These are the sorts of topics that MBAs will spend their time talking about. Uh, and it says here, no company in the United States exemplifies this deficiency more than Cisco Systems. Now, when you look at the firm today, the basics... This is a $216 billion company. They have a simple valuation ratio of four, which is simply market cap divided by annualized revenues, and that compares to our catalog average of 6.5. They pay a dividend. It's a yield of about 3%. Gross margins, I was surprised to see this, in lower 60s consistently. So uh, it's a pretty well-run business from that perspective. They've paid a dividend now for 10 years and increased it let's say, for 10 years. So certainly uh, starting that track record, they'll need to become a dividend champion. Um, is this growth or value? That's the question. So when we look at growth, this is a chart here on the left of the revenues plotted over the past 10 years. And you can pay attention to uh, the scale we're using here because this actually represents a 10-year compound annual growth rate of just 1%. Doesn't look like it, does it? 
you look at the chart on the right, this is the last four quarters, you can see that nice consistency over time. We'll take a look at this. This is their revenues plotted over the past decade um, using the, the proper uh, scale there. And you can see they're just, they're just not doing anything. It's just flatlined, completely flatlined. You see the breakdown here between services and product. Now, this begs the question, what does Cisco do? And that gets confusing when you start looking on the tin and you see all these different things, networking, security, collaboration, data center, analytics, video. There's all this stuff. And to peer through that fog, what you do is get down into the revenue segmentations. Now, here's how they used to segment revenues. And this is just an interesting example taken from that paper that shows five of eight product segments between 2010 and 2017. And I've highlighted two here. Look at service provider video, a niche that they were getting into and how badly that failed before they finally decided to stop working in that area. Look at data center. This is where they should have been excelling. They should. This was the opportunity. This is when NVIDIA made all their, all these firms were starting to make all their headwinds to really become players in data center. And Cisco just piddled out over the years. Data center isn't even one of their current segments. These are their current product revenue segments. Okay, if you break down their business, remember that previous slide we saw services and products. Products being the majority or in for the last year, 74% of total revenues. Well, here's what that breaks down into. These categorizations they adopted last year, they're new. So you see that 63% of product revenues come from this secure, agile networks. I'm not going to read what each of these categories means. We've put it here on the slide. You can pause it and take a look if you like. But the takeaway there is that this is a segment that accounts for the majority of product revenues, and it grew 2% over the last two years. Internet for the future, that grew 26%, so perhaps they're doing something exciting there. But look at collaboration, and this just makes me think about back in the day, everybody jumped on a WebEx, Cisco's WebEx, and that was, that was the Zoom back then. How the hell did this great communication company lose that to Zoom? They screwed that over huge. They should have been Zoom, and they messed up. And you can see here that collaboration over time just continues to get worse. Then you have end-to-end -end security. Uh, they're dabbling in things like network cloud security, zero trust, bits like that. That's experiencing some growth, so that's good. But another way to look at their business that they provide investors, and they provide a lot. You go to their investor relations section, and they have somewhere around the range of like six to ten spreadsheets that you can download with all this data that could be mined for insights, and certainly analysts do that. But here's annual recurring revenues in an attempt to look like a SaaS firm. And they talk about run rate of active subscriptions, licenses, maintenance contracts. This can include um, products and services, and you see those broken down there. Uh, and then for, I guess, the last time that we saw this measured, February 2023, um, this annual recurring revenue, which we would assume uh, one could also associate a net retention rate and a gross retention rate with, though they haven't done that. This is the extent of the SaaS metrics they provide that we found. Uh, this accounts for 43% of total revenue. So provided that's growing over time, and you can see it's not really growing that much, right? So you have 19, 20, 21 there on the left-hand side, and then we put in 23, the most recent measurement. So it hasn't grown very much. Um, not sure that SaaS direction makes sense here, um, but they do break these down further. However, uh, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Instead, let's look at fiscal year 2022. A couple interesting things to note here. So uh, certainly a diverse portfolio of product offerings that will probably enjoy the conglomerate effect to, to a certain extent. These things uh, all seem rather related for this to be a conglomerate, but uh, they're different enough that the categories could offset one, uh, one another. They have clients all over the globe, as you can see here, 60% coming from the Americas, and then 27% EMEA, 16% APAC. 98% of their clientele are Fortune 500 companies, so everybody kind of uses Cisco. As I said, gross margins consistently in the low 60s. It's quite impressive, but near zero revenue growth, as we pointed out, and uh, it, certainly, there's an underexposure here to recurring revenues, and 
Um, what Cisco appears to be is a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And you can see her on this slide where they're talking about these trends that they expect to benefit from work from anywhere. Well, that's really Zoom is all over that. Uh, you have this, you know, cost of global cyber crime. Well, there are a lot of good cybersecurity companies to invest in if you're looking for that sort of exposure. And of course, this surging AI workloads are trying to uh, get in on that. You couldn't have a slide about uh, what you were up to without mentioning AI. But it's not very compelling. And the question here, is this a value play? Well, they have stable dividend growth now over the past uh, 10 years with a yield of 3%. Um, that means there's a reputation to uphold then that uh, the dividend will keep increasing and their healthy uh, payout ratio around 55% means they can likely continue to do that. Um, the growth story just isn't here, though, and perhaps in 15 years uh, when it's a dividend champion and, and they've established some growth and some focus, then maybe there's uh, something to look at here, at least from our perspective and our interests, we invest in disruptive tech or dividend growth, and this seems to fall into the gap between those two. And then going back to that paper, which is uh, worth a read uh, if you have the time, you're interested in that sort of thing. But that title, From Innovation to Financialization, and this really epitomizes uh, the story, this chart here which shows how they started to use share buybacks to engineer better returns for shareholders. And there's a big debate around buybacks. We're not going to get into that. We could probably do a, an entire presentation around that, whether or not there's a lot of debate whether buybacks are good for investors or not. Certainly, they decrease the pie. IBM uh, has used them to uh, increase dividends per share. So if you kept your dividend payment constant and reduce the number of shares and dividend increases. That's a clever way there to increase your dividend payment over time. That's why you look at dividends per share. Um, but you can see here uh, how they've been uh, certainly look at how it's almost as if they're buying back there is increasing the share price uh, performance uh, as they uh, buy heavily, it looks, in 2018 and 2019. So that idea there was that they went from focusing on innovating uh, and uh, over time lost that focus and then just started using financial engineering to show shareholders they were doing something. So to conclude, Cisco doesn't have, we believe, the growth story to appeal to growth investors. Uh, the dividend growth track record, that's just getting started from, from um, where we sit. We start to look at dividend growth firms when they have at least increased their dividend for 25 years or more, so they're a champion. This is ex an example of a leader that became a laggard, and we're very careful about turnaround stories or firms that lost their direction or trying to stage a comeback. Lots of times that doesn't work. Their excessive acquisitions, while that seems to have worked and generated some serious returns over time, that's also led to a lack of direction. As I said, we invest in disruptive tech or dividend growth, and this doesn't fit either. This might be worth a look in 15 years as a dividend growth tech play. Now, I'm going to put up another video here for you to watch. Before I do that, please click the Nanalyze logo here on the right. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.